Henry Steingarten, very famously, in one of his books, uh, asked, for nearly, nearly every bite I take, in the back of my mind there looms the same nagging question, who's having all the fun? Is it my brain, or is it real? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeffrey, it's actually a bit of both. Um, everything we do is the responsibility of the brain, but that gives rise to feelings, emotions, sensations, and so on. And also, just to give you a quick primer of what happened when we do smell, um, the smell enters the, the nares and nostrils and the um, They stimulate the olfactory receptors here, which then send a signal to this um, bulbous structure called the olfactory bulb, which has been likened to a, a deflated balloon on a cheese grater, because that's what it looks like if you do a, a post-mortem. And then the information goes to the back of the throat, stimulate the receptors here. If you're breathing in normally, of course, you don't stimulate your olfactory receptors that much. You do a little bit of that. And then when you breathe out, there's very little um, stimulation of the receptors. Then from here, the information is transmitted through these little bulbs here, which we think is where the first stage of analysis happens. This is where the brain begins to try and make sense of the odor molecule. And from there, it's sent to the subcortex, and there, this is a cross-section of the most recently developed part of the brain, and that's the cortex itself, which is the, the outer part of the brain, and the largest part of the brain. And the signals are sent to not just this bit here, to the cortex, but also this system here called the limbic system. Uh, and then given to it in 1962 by Paul McLean because he thought these structures work together in some way. And they do because they allow us to, uh, they're, well, they're very involved in emotional motivation. Sex, hunger, temperature, thirst, all of these structures are involved in them. And in fact, once upon a time, this used to be called the brine encephalon or smell brain because its principal role, this system was thought to be perceiving smell. We know that it isn't because they're involved in all sorts of other things, these structures like face perception, memory formation, and so on. But in particular, this little structure here, the amygdala, appears to be particularly important because this uh, responds to the pleasantness uh, of smells. But also, we also now know that this part of the brain here, the front part, also has a role to play. And specifically, this bit here. Uh, we know that if you damage this area, People have great difficulty in identifying odors. This is the this is the frontal lobe here, by the way, which is the uh, about a third of the brain. It's the most recently developed in terms of evolution, and the motor strip is here. The, uh, the part of the brain that allows you to speak is here. Um, it plays a role in personality in allowing us to express emotion and experience emotion and recognise it. And if you damage this bit here, which is the temporal lobe. Again, people have difficulty in identi uh, detecting odors. So their ability to detect an odor is almost uh, demolished if this part of the brain is uh, damaged. Another intriguing side effect of damage to this part of the brain is that frontal lobe patients <coughs> are not able to follow recipes adequately. So if they're asked to make a soup, for example, they may leave out an important state stage in the process. So they may not heat the soup or they may forget to put the soup in the pan, or they may forget to add an important ingredient. And that's a symptom of frontal lobe damage in, in general, um, this inability to follow things sequentially <coughs> in logical orders. In vigilance, can be either improved or actually impaired. In one of our experiments, for example, we found that when people um, smelt uh, bergamot uh, or peppermint throughout the course of the experiment, Peppermint had no effect on visual vigilance. We had them doing a task very similar to air traffic controllers' task, where they had to sort of pick up small um, stimuli on a, a raised stimuli on the screen. In fact, we found that bergamot made that performance worse, and as the experiment progressed, it became even more uh, impaired. Another experiment we did found that people were actually better at braking during a simulated driving exercise, where they were in the presence of lemon scent. But interestingly, there was an interaction with sex. And that is, the men were much better at it. So men exposed to the scent of lemon um, actually performed certain driving operations better than did the, the women in this experiment. And there are a few more um, little examples there. I won't go through them all. This one's quite interesting. Um, one experimenter um, administered the, the aroma of orange oil into a dentist's waiting area to see whether this would reduce anxiety for people going into their, their operation. Um, and found that in fact in women, 
this smell did reduce the amount of anxiety um, that they experienced. On the other hand, a few years ago, now in 2006, we set up an experiment of what you might call the purest test of aromatherapy. Uh, it does a smell actually make you experience less pain. And in fact, what we found was that, no, it doesn't. In fact, if anything, the opposite. Exposure to the aroma of lemon and also machine oil actually made people experience more pain during the course of an experiment um, than less. Um, and we, we, um, we did a bit of publicity about this at the time because we presented it at the uh, conference in Macau. Um, and the, the reports came out on April the 1st. Um, thankfully, that was a bit of an omen because um, after this result was published, um, there were headlines in the paper saying scientists say aromatherapy is bogus and bunker and so on. Uh, it will happen to Simon Singh recently, you know, you have to be very careful about these things. Um, we did receive, you know, a number of uh, what you might call death threats from aromatherapists. <laughs> and um, if, uh, if you've ever been threatened by an aromatherapist, it's, it's quite a lot It's like being warned by a rabbit. <laughs> um, so, you know. Absolutely misguided, but tolerable. I suppose of all the foods that, that are thought to have an effect on behaviour, chocolate is the one that comes up quite frequently um, because um, of the chemicals it contains. It's like a portable pharmacy. There's a huge amount of chemicals, and because of this, people have um, suggested that these chemicals affect our behaviour in some way. Well, the interesting thing about chocolate is if you just take the smell of chocolate, first of all, I um, would look at the chemical composition of it because that's not an extra. Um, but the smell of it is interesting because there have been some experiments that have found that people spend longer looking at slides when there's chocolate present. <coughs> um, they recall more words when the pre uh, chocolate was present at encoding, that is, the learning of the words and then the recall of the words. When chocolate aroma is paired with a uh, painting, the artistic merit of the photo of the painting is rated as being better. Um, compared with no odor. And then interestingly, um, just recently there was a study that found that consumption of chocolate seems to be greater in Parkinson's disease, uh, which may tell us a little bit about how the brain uh, processes the <coughs> pleasurable qualities of eating chocolate and why we do it possibly. So as you can see, the smell of chocolate has effects that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily think it actually has. And in terms of eating, it also has some peculiar effects. Now, to summarize a few of these, the slide behind me. Um, in one experiment, um, cyclists actually um, drank a chocolate flavored uh, drink or a non chocolate flavored drink, and they found that cyclists cycled around 49 to 51% longer after ingesting the, the milk chocolate drink. And they also became less exhausted uh, less quickly, more exhausted less quickly. In terms of whether it improves your mood, um, a nice series of studies by Dr. <coughs> Matt, a, a German psychologist, I think of Munich, found that eating both apple and chocolate improved mood, uh, but the effect of chocolate was stronger. And in another experiment that, that he did, he um, actually sought to see whether eating chocolate um, either elevated your positive mood, reduced your negative mood, or left you completely cold after you watched a, a film designed to make you happy, a film designed to make you sad, or a film designed to to have no emotional effect on them at all, and found that um, the chocolate eating reduced the negative mood after the people watched the sad film, but there's no effect on positive mood. So eating chocolate while you're watching a film that you like didn't necessarily make the film more likely. However, uh, when they watched the rather sad film, it made them feel a little less sad. Um, something I suppose that, you know, um, Later throughout the, the decades, may have been able to tell these researchers um, already without necessarily having to do the exam. Um, also, bad mood seems to be reduced after eating palatable chocolate, that is, up to 70% cocoa, but the effect is short lived. And that's the thing about these experiments the effects are actually quite short lived, um, so they're temporary. One final thing on chocolate, I um, don't want to tell you about. Um, this is an experiment we did quite a few years ago now, uh, but surprisingly, it was the first experiment of the effect of food aroma on brain activity. Now, you might have thought that before 1998, um, someone somewhere had done such an experiment, but in fact, they hadn't. Um, and the technique we, use, we used was developed in 1872, um, so it was a bit of a mission, I think you might, uh, might agree. 
So what we did was this. Uh, we had a, uh, what's called a neuroscience brain imager. Uh, we didn't test him, uh, really. Uh, one look at him would suggest why we didn't test him. Uh, so that's the machine. And it's an EEG machine, essentially. So it records the electrical activity from the brain, and it's fed through this amplifier, and the uh, activity is picked up through these electrons here on an electron cap. This is what a lateral participant looked like uh, in the olfactorium. This is at the uh, University of Warwick at the time. And you can see she's wearing goggles to prevent her from seeing um, the experimenter, and also headphones as well to prevent her from hearing. So the only thing, the only sense that's really exposed is the sense of smell. And in the experiment, there were two experiments. We asked participants to smell either the odors of real food or synthetic um, aromas, which were very close analogs to the, the real thing. So the synthetic odors included things like spearmint, um, chocolate, uh, pickled onions, um, strawberry, and the real food odors included things like rotten pork, coffee, chocolate, um, and what was the other? Baked beans uh, was the other. <coughs> And we record it, e.g., from all over the scalp. So these are the positions of the electrodes, so all over the, the brain. And in fact, this is what we found. In the first experiment, we found some very interesting results with chocolate and also with spirit. And these two odors were associated with a reduction in a particular type of brain frequency called theta. There are four classical frequencies, but this is the effect it had on this one frequency especially compared to the other odors. And when we looked at the psychometric data, that is, how they rated the odors psychologically, these were the two odors rated most pleasant and also most relaxing. So we thought, well, that was interesting. And then in the second experiment with the, the real odors, if you have a look at the graph on the left hand side, notice again how chocolate is associated with an extreme reduction in this particular wavelength of theta compared to the, the other odors. Now, why should that be? Well, my hypothesis is that the brain isn't necessarily responding to the smell, but to the associations between the smell and what it creates. So the, because it's rated as pleasant and relaxing, first of all, it has those two effects on the person's behavior. The person may also be thinking about the connotations to chocolate, thinking of chocolate cake, thinking of the past, and so on, which means they're distracted. And what we do know about this frequency in particular is that the less distracted people are, the more activity there is. If you're given a very challenging mental arithmetic task, you tend to find a lot of this theta activity. But whereas if you're distracted, you tend to produce less of it. So that was our reasoning for this particular problem. 